Good afternoon and welcome to the Engineering Talent Awards nominees interviews. These are brought to you by Equal Engineers. We are an organization focused on improving the diversity and inclusion of the engineering industry. And you can find out more about us on our website. This is a series of webinar interviews led by myself, Fayon Dixon, and David Pergy. We're in discussion with those who were in nomination mode for this year's awards. And our awards, unfortunately, due to uh, take place in April, have been postponed because of the corona pandemic until the future. Let's just say the future. <laughs> okay. So we do invite you all to send in any questions or any need for any technical support at all via the Q&A facility. Frazier is our IT guru and he's there waiting for you should you need him. The link to all of these videos, including this webinar today, will be available on our website once they're all complete. So do please rewatch and share to everyone. Okay, so today I am talking to George Lamb, who's studying at Manchester University, and he's been nominated for Engineering Student of the Year Award. Welcome, George. Really great to finally talk to you here. How are you doing? Hi. Yeah, I get, what, what a time to be alive, I guess, with everything going on. <laughs> Yeah, we've certainly got some stories to tell, haven't we? It'd be like, what were you doing for the first half of 2020? Well, let me see. <laughs> yeah, it's broken up into different books. Oh my gosh, we, we've got a, a, a series upon series of books. So tell us the impact of coronavirus for you as a graduate in lockdown. What, what has that been like for you? Yeah, so uh, for, for us at Manchester, the disruption's been going on same as everybody really since about March and um, graduating that's that's a big change because it means we've had to complete all of our assessments at home and our examinations have been cancelled and stuff has been assessed on previous things uh, I just found out today actually that graduation uh, is probably going to take place later in the year hopefully but again that's one of those things that's subject to um, you know restrictions but there'll be some sort of online celebrations hopefully so we can still finish on a high oh absolutely right yeah, i mean everybody's worked so so hard you know there's nobody that hasn't been affected by this in some way so best thing to do is just stay positive and get in those mini wins whenever you can <laughs> so it is really good to talk to you and you know we've invited our audience our guests to come in and find out more about you know your life as well as your studies so Let's make a start on when did you know you wanted to be an engineer? So for me, I, I think it's um, since as, as, as long as I can remember uh, in terms of education, absolutely. So the earliest engineering related memory I have is when I, um, I went into the cockpit of a, um, when I was young on holiday, and I actually have a little picture here that I dug out of the archive. So there's little George. Um, in, in the cockpit and I remember going up and I was just fascinated by by that uh, and since then I've, I've wanted to be uh, well at least a pilot and um, secretly a national I would say so yeah I just remember playing with space toys watching engineering type programs like Bob the Builder um, my dad was a joiner so all all that sort of theme has just been there since the start for me and apparently in my play group um, when I was younger than that that photograph, I uh, apparently there's a space corner, and apparently, according to my aunt who works there at the time, I was always in the space corner, and I had no idea about this, but I guess it's been there since uh, since an early age. So you're calling it the space corner, but maybe it was the naughty corner. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, it's worked out quite well in that case, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, um, what was study like for you at primary school? So uh, I went to St. Michael's Primary School in, in Old Crichton, uh, not too far away from where I live now. And um, again, I, I remember that, that theme of engineering sort of carrying on into, uh, into school. And in year one, I had a great teacher called Mrs. Rain. 
and um, in that class they actually <laughs> I used to get coined the nickname Professor George so I must have been doing something to do with science or engineering that, that would have earned me that, that nickname um, and I, I loved the, the very little science that we did because science was a I wasn't really a proper fully fledged class then um, but I loved doing anything that we did um, so yeah primary school was pretty pretty much the same for me and I, I, I enjoyed the subjects I really enjoyed primary school um, so yeah it's good that's great and it's good to have opportunities to explore your passion from so so uh, young isn't it so um, tell us a little bit about your secondary education did the love of science sort of translate into into higher school higher learning yeah so I went to Middleton Technology School and uh, I actually really enjoyed my time there um, but I always thought I was terrible at maths ironically um, I, I ended up doing quite well I got I got an A in maths but I was just I always thought I was bad at it um, and I always thought other people around me were, were much better at it um, but there was another subject that I took up which was uh, design and technology as part of my technology GCSE and I really loved that so that was designing um, just very small, like maybe like a kitchen gadget or something. But we did like technical drawings, and, and it's actually something my mum did when she was younger. So I don't know if that uh, runs in the family there or something, but I just really enjoyed that side of it. Um, I ended up getting an A star in that subject, and I just had great teachers, like teachers who just you know encourage your your passion for it. Um, but also at the same time, I was becoming more interested in in the, in sort of space programs and Apollo and I've been reading books since I was since I was young, even in primary school, about the universe. So I was always had this interest in in physics and the universe generally, and that sort of translated more into aerospace engineering when I figured out um, what you know what other astronauts did to get there back in the '60s because they were all aeronautical engineers. So I was just looking at what they did, and that just inspired me more. I think. Just amazing, isn't it? And isn't that funny how even though your future was kind of written from an early age, you still questioned yourself. There were still seeds of doubt there or you still compared yourself to others. And do you look back now and just think, why, why did I do that? You know? <laughs> yeah, I think as a, when, when you're an adult, you just have a completely different uh, perspective on school and everything that happened. And I think um, there must be so many other, other other kids out there who have similar thoughts and think, you know, I want to do this. Um, but at the time, you just don't really, you know, think it's possible. And especially sort of if you're, you know, um, going to sort of a normal school, an area where people just kind of stay on, or they, they finish school early, or they just go into, you know, what your mom and dad did. Um, I think it, it, those big dreams are sort of just lost. But I think, you know, everyone starts out with them at some point. Mm. I feel also uh, there's a lot of young people out there that don't have uh, an example in their life, somebody who has actually gone through it themselves maybe or can encourage them, but sometimes that doesn't matter. I mean, for you, who are your biggest supporters? I think first and foremost, my parents. So my mum and dad, um, since as far as I can remember, I've just never questioned anything I wanted to do. So like not possible was never really a thing. So if I wanted to, um, you know, I said, if, even I said, if I said in secondary school, I want to go to this university to do physics or I want to go and do aerospace engineering, they're like, okay. Like, okay, well, what do you need to do? Um, there's all sorts of restrictions in terms of money and whatever you can name, but the idea of doing it and the actual, the limits were never imposed on me from at home. Um, and so if I said I wanted to be an astronaut to my mum, at an early age she would have said okay and I said it recently again and she said okay so like it, it's not a you know what are you thinking you're crazy it's um it's just whatever you love doing do it um so I've got them to thank for that yeah. um, and also and you know you're not from a, a wealthy family there's no massive wealth in your family in any way you're from a normal work, working class family aren't you so yeah. I guess because you'd shown such passion and commitment all the way through and your parents seem like pretty cool people who are like, you know, our, our son, you know, we just want to support him. I guess they worked hard to make sure that you could fulfill your dream and you showed them that you'd work to get there. 
yeah, I was always really careful with the opportunities I took. And um, when it came to, to money, where they could, they were there. But, you know, thankfully, when, when later on we came to university, we, there's all sorts of, of barriers there. But the actual passion of doing it um, and getting on those courses and, and pursuing it, buying books, just, you know, feeding that interest, I've always been right behind it. And even, you know, teachers along the way, um, I go back to my year one teacher, Mrs. Frain, she gave me uh, a huge sort of A1, bigger than that size poster. It was just like a big uh, big star constellation or something. I still have it in my wardrobe. Um, and that, you know, just people along the way feeding that interest, encouraging you, I think that's what's, what's made the difference. You never forget those good teachers. You know, I remember um, Mrs. Yeomans, you know, our head of year. I remember um, my, my English teacher, uh, Mr. Brooks, you know, and I had the opportunity to go back to my old school and deliver a motivational workshop as an adult. And my art teacher, Mrs. Cook was there, Mr. Brooks was there you know, uh, Mr. Holforth, another head of year. And they remembered me and they were like, you know, we knew you could do it. We knew you could do it. Well done. I was like, thank you. Because <laughs> <laughs> at the time, you just, you got no real idea if you're doing okay or not. People are encouraging you, but you're fighting off all the voices that are like, oh, I'm not sure if I can or not. And, um, you know, it's, it's just incredible that you can be on this journey and have all this support around you. But let's talk about the obstacles, um, because they're always there. And the obstacles that you're faced, you're faced with the beginning of university and, of course, your present situation. Yeah, so, um, you know, obstacles, there's, there's so many. But I think in terms of where I got to now at university, um, I actually lacked an A-level maths when I came to university um, because in college, I the college I went to, I didn't sort of enjoy the atmosphere. I didn't really fit in properly. So I, I, I took up other courses. I took up English literature, politics, and still took physics because I couldn't let, you know, the, 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 the childhood dream down. Um, but I really enjoyed those other subjects. Um, I just enjoyed exploring them. But then I really sort of, uh, realize that because I I did pursue AS maths and I actually I failed it's not something I tell people about often but I failed A level uh, AS level maths I got a U and that's just because I didn't enjoy what I was doing at the time um, didn't mean I couldn't do it because obviously where I am now but I just didn't enjoy it at the time so there was that huge obstacle so back then I was thinking what can I do to get myself back on that track of that childhood dream because I've done this other stuff now but yeah I want to go back um, and for me, I, I, I discovered the foundation year at the University of Manchester. And that's sort of a nine month, uh, just another year before the programme, where you just bring up to speed. Um, so I decided to aim for that. So this was at the very beginning of those two years when I failed that exam. And I thought, I'm going to aim for that. And I just, you know, stuck my head down um, and carried on for that. And here I am. I love that reference to maths and I'm not saying I love the fact that you failed but at the end of the day you're succeeding so it, it's not an issue and I think it's important that people hear about failures because all they see is the wins and it's like well it's all right for you you know you've got this you've got that and um, my youngest stepdaughter Amber she you know I, she started off really well with maths I thought in secondary school but then I guess she just kind of got lost along the way and just lost interest and went into groups that were um you know lower ability and she just sort of got left behind but she stopped trying as well to be honest you know you speak to her now she's 16 didn't get to do her GCSEs this year and you know, she knows she could have worked harder, but since lockdown, she's been studying her own way of learning about criminology, something that she's really interested in. She loves all the NCIS, she loves Dexter, and she was saying to us the other day about blood splats um, and how through, you know, watching these TV shows, she's now worked out how to do it. And she now knows that it was about radius and pi and, you know, sort of measurements. And she realizes that she did learn something, but she'd know so much more now if she'd done a little bit better at maths, but it doesn't matter. She's got a passion 
for crime, sort of criminology, and she's learning through that. So it's just so important that you do have a passion because you will find maths within that passion. <laughs> yeah, and that, you know, as I discovered, um, even though I, I did it in the end, I was still capable. That initial that initial period was really difficult. Um, and at the time, I remember my tutor and other people saying, "Okay, perhaps you should, you know, pursue those other subjects that you did, like the politics and the English." And I thought to myself, "Well." yeah but that's not what I want to do um and I actually I mentioned the idea of a foundation year to one of my I don't think she was actually my maths teacher I think she was called Miss Johnson and she said you know it's an option you can do it um and so when it came round, I thought okay you know I'm gonna do it and um just having that tunnel vision I think got me there in the end but anyone just can do it I think it's just having the strength of mind to keep that passion alive um, and you'll get there in the end so you opted to stay at home through university. So what was it like, the sort of being off campus? What was that like for you? Yeah, so um, I actually got the trans university. So when I went to college, I'd go the other way. And one day I, I got on the other side of the platform when I started university because I was going into the centre of Manchester. Um, so I commuted every day for the past four years at university. Um, and it's at first, uh, I wasn't really bothered about, you know, uh, going out in pressures or, you know, losing, losing everything or just, uh, I just wanted to, 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 you know, for me, I've worked hard through those two years to get to that point. And I thought, you know, finally I'm here. And it, it wasn't easy for me to get into Manchester. Um, I thought I pretty much scraped through. Um, but just because I was so thankful that I had the opportunity to get to that point, I knew that was it then and I could make it through the rest of the journey so um the social side of things um i think really got going probably in the first or second year when i got onto the actual aerospace course and i made good friends and now uh leaving you know, i'm leaving with friends for life so um it didn't bother me living at home because i had the support of, of mum and dad still behind me like i had through all those other years which was a huge bonus and they took a lot of the weight and a lot of the pressure off my shoulders when it came to studying and exams um, and it didn't stop me getting involved because I ended up creating um, my own society, Evo, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, and then everything started to fall into place when I got really involved. And then from then, I've just been taking up as many opportunities as I can. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it limits, limits you. Um, and I, I have other friends who commute as well. So I think uh, whatever works for you, really. Yeah, find your interest, absolutely right. So tell us about EVO, what does it stand for and why did you feel you needed to set it up? So uh, EVO stands for the Engineering, Volunteering and Outreach Society uh, and I founded it back in September 2018, I think. Um, so I did a, a, a summer internship in the, in the Department of, of Mechanical Aerospace and Civil Engineering at, at my university uh, that, that previous summer. And that was on social responsibility and exploring new ways of embedding that within the school. And I chose that because I was quite interested off um, an invitation I think I got from my tutor to go into a school and do some outreach. And I thought, well, when I was, when I was young, when I was in school, you know, I, I, I was interested in science, physics, you know, Apollo, NASA. Um, but engineering, I always, you, you always assume it's some, like a, someone in overalls in a garage working on a car like a mechanic. And it's absolutely not that 90% um, of the time. So uh, I thought, yeah, you know, I want to create a society where I can get students to go into you know, to schools, colleges, and, and get the idea in early that uh, if you can teach something about engineering and then say, hey, look, did you know that was engineering? Then um, it's a really good way of sparking that interest and not sort of just trying to change the image of engineering, I think. Uh, so that's why I started it and um, we've been going now coming up to two years um, and it's going well so yeah. Excellent, excellent. So now that you've, uh, you, well, graduation is literally knocking on your door, are you going to continue that in some way even though you're not there? Have you left people in sort of in your wake who can sort of carry it on? Yeah I'd absolutely love to carry it on myself because we, we've got to the point now where we can take off just with a little bit of you know support and work so I actually applied for funding from uh, the Institute of 
mechanical mechanical engineers and the IET, and we got a grant for uh, I think it was fifteen hundred pounds, and then we also got money from the university from their outreach scheme. So we had uh, I think total about five thousand one hundred pounds ready to go to spend on our activities and to produce really good things for schools um, to get kids involved. So we had a little bit of taster the year before doing a science fair and that went really well. We got really good feedback from the teachers and I was amazed because, you know, they didn't understand it themselves, but they were like, can you come in and do this in our schools? And so I thought, you know, we're onto something here. It, you know, it's working. So I've, I've decided to graduate this year because I want to move on to, to other stuff in, in the space. But um, yeah, I've, I've got a great uh, team set up behind and, and taking on people at the moment who I think can really, uh, help take the society forward. I'll probably still be there, backseat driving to some to some extent, in the background, um, hopefully. But yeah, I think it's going to be a really good year for Eva. That's fantastic. And you know, we can make loads and loads of plans, can't we? We can make plans for our future. You know, my family, my husband and I, we have plans for this and that. And as we know, bam, out of the blue, you know, COVID nineteen comes and. Plans don't always go the way we want them to. So tell us what happened for you and what you feel about going forward, because I know some of your plans have not worked out. Yeah, so I, I had a couple of things lined up straight after graduation. I had a, a placement at Royal Forest Defence. Um, it was something I, I went down in the middle of exams for an interview, and I was really excited to get it. And then obviously that's been cancelled with all the, the, the job cuts and everything. And then... Um, I actually found this course at the International Space University and I thought, okay, this is up my street. Um, and it was a space studies course, but that had a huge tuition fee associated with it. So I was lucky enough to get a scholarship from the European Space Agency to cover most of that. And then I had to crowdfund a little bit more. So I, I did a bit of a crowdfund, reached out to people I'd met through the university and through my experiences there. And surprisingly, I came out with a decent amount at the end of it. And I, I couldn't believe the support I'd got from people who I hadn't spoke to in years. I was really thankful. And then that got cancelled. So I'll be doing that in, uh, next summer, hopefully, uh, so long as nothing else changes. Um, but yeah, it, my immediate plans are, have, have, have been cancelled effectively. And um, I was looking to do a master's from this October, as I was saying before, in more of a space orientated course. Um, and I'll be applying for that. but. Yeah, things don't always go to plan, but I think it's just about, you know, taking time to think, reset, take a time out if you need to, um, and just get yourself back on track and think, okay, what can I do to still make this dream possible? Is there anything I can do to contribute towards that dream, even if it's plus 1%? So, yeah, the same happened back in college. I was talking about my elbow maths. Um, and back then I thought, okay, is, it, is there still possible? Is there still a way? And there was, so I worked towards that, even though, you know, it was two years off. So I think just hold on. Uh, everyone else is in the same boat, is what I'd say to others as well. So keep calm and carry on, as, as the VE day generation would say. My gosh, it, this is it. We're totally emulating that time. And, you know, there's a lot of wisdom to be found in the older generation because they have been through this or worse, in fact. And... You know, some people that we go to sometimes don't always have the answers for us. So we might reach out to other people. Um, I know you have some very special people in your life. Um, you mentioned an Auntie Gloria, is it? How's she helping you out? Uh, that's, that's right. So it's actually my great, great auntie. Um, and she's, she's turning 95 in a month's time. And she's one of the most incredible women that I know. Um, she's definitely the most positive person that I know and if you if you go to her with she's completely switched on and if you go to her with any worries or any concerns or you're just talking about you know how's your day or whatever then even if it's you know I just lost my job or something it would be okay well you know things will be better let's you know let's do this or um, you know don't worry about it what, what's the point in worrying it'll get you nowhere and it's just that positivity um, and there's been some really difficult moments and I've gone around, you know, uh, quite mentally upset. And then I come out the other side thinking, everything's great. I'm so lucky. Um, so, yeah, I, I've just got the pleasure to know her. And I wish the world had access to that, um, to that positivity and that knowledge. 
So yeah, apart from you know, Antigore, yeah, um, there are those friends around you, mum, dad. But I think Antigore is a really special uh, person to me for, for reaching out when you know nothing's clear and you don't know what to do. Mm. I mean, in a world where we've just you know, there's no control on anything. You know, how, you know, how do you stay positive? It's great to have the access to people who are like, there's no point worrying, you know, excuse me, because I'm typed. <laughs> you know, there's no point worrying. Just, you know, keep going, stay positive. And it can get a bit tiresome sometimes when you hear people saying that, but it's true, you know, so you've got your own coping mechanisms and it seems to be working well for you. And um, I've just got to say in the chat, um, and I'm encouraging people to come on in and ask questions because that's what we love. But, um, oh, David Lamb um, has said, hi, George, how are you? Joining you from Perth, Australia. Hello. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's my uncle. Hi, David. Uh, hope things are well down there. <laughs> Oh, wow, how lovely. Thank you so much for joining in. Um, I'm imagining it's quite late into the evening there. Not late, late, but it's getting into the evening. So thank you for joining us. And, um, you know, it's great to have um, George Lamb here um, up for nominee. He's a nominee, rather, and he's up for Engineering Student Award of the Year. So if you have any questions to ask George about his journey, then, you know, jump in at any time I'm absolutely fascinated in talking to him because he's done so much <laughs> you know you're so young but you, you're packing it in and you've got all of the support around you so let's ask that question about graduation I almost don't want to ask but what's the update so I got an email this morning and I think it's looking like there are possibly a formal ceremony later in the year when you can go in person because that's what you've worked for four years, right? To get that piece of paper on the stage. So hopefully that will be later in the year. But um, they also hinted at some online uh, sort of celebration. So I guess there might be a giant Zoom call. I don't know. I don't know how you manage that. Um, but that would be, be something. And it, for me, it's more about reflecting on those four years and thinking, you know, look where you started, even go back to college where you thought you just failed math, maths, is that it? And then you know, fast forward uh, those six years and you know, I'm here, I've done it, I've got the degree in the bag, it's not going anywhere. So it's just a really nice feeling reflecting on those four years and thinking, you know, what happened when I was age four or three or whatever to get me to this point? And it, it's funny how nothing's changed and um, I think, you know, I meet a lot of people who say, I've got no idea what I want to do. And I'm like, well, you know, I can't, I can't personally relate, but um, I think it's just encouraging people to find their passions. And for me, that's always been space aviation exploration. And so uh, that, that's what's kept me taking, I think. So from the space corner, aka the naughty corner, you know, you've come a long way, haven't you? And your family, I know um, your uncle's saying how proud they are of you. It's actually 8.30 in the evening. I thought it would be still sort of early evening. But they are super proud of you. But, you know, you've told us about Evo. Tell us about some of the other. I mean, you know, for me doing these interviews, for some people are very some people are very shy to talk about themselves and you know they don't want to talk they don't want to sound like they're showing off or whatever but this is what we need to promote we need to promote people who are working hard and changing things so things don't just drop in your lap you know you've got to work hard for them so i do want you to talk about other achievements so you talked about your grant you talked about evo what else can you share yeah well for me achievements are sort of the a culmination of stuff you've done so i you could even say this webinar is an achievement because to get to this point you know, you've got to have some sort of credibility some sort of background that says okay you know he's done this that's good um and so when it comes to this question i never really think about those specific uh achievements objectives grades because for me it's all about you know the bigger picture so evo for me was something that um, I started with drawing just a, a sketch on a piece of paper because I was thinking, how does the logo look? It's got to have a good logo. 
and then you know fast forward year and a half and then this institution who's been running for hundreds of years have said okay here's some money for your activities and for them to trust sort of the thing i created was really uh special for me because it's it's come from scratch um and then now all the bigger things have started rolling in now and comes graduation like the space university rolls royce and um also my dissertation that i just completed so i did it based on um what had been happening with with boeing's aircraft and the accidents they were happening and so i thought i want to try and you know create something that could be used as an alternative perhaps one day to prevent those accidents so um starting that from scratch as well and not not being given it a sort of a title that you can just work on and having the guidance only of your supervisor on your own knowledge um that was really special because I, I just came up with this theory that i thought might work and then fast forward nine months and it turned out you know it's it, you know it's, it's quite right and with with the right amount of work something really good could come out of it so those are sort of the the wider achievements that represent the culmination of work that i really look back on myself as achievements and i'm sure there are like many little moments that um that, you know the certificate of folders in there i don't know what half of them are for but it's more about the bigger picture for me um so yeah that, that's what i our class is my achievements and just getting here getting to this interview <laughs> <laughs> well i'm so glad that you will uh, put this in your memoirs <laughs> at that time <laughs> on a webinar with us because we're so glad to have you so um what would you tell other people who or anyone who wishes to pursue a career in engineering and you know maybe they are not doing so well in maths for instance or not doing so well in science or have doubted that they can do it yeah so i think quite simply um just have that have that dream i think that's the the first thing what what is it you want to do do you want to study engineering do you want to be an astronaut um you know don't don't automatically think that's something i don't do because somebody has to do it so uh you know there will be obstacles there will be setbacks but when you question it always stick with your instincts and if your instinct says if i work hard enough i might be able to do it then do it and also just get yourself involved in experiences even if it's got nothing to do with engineering the more experiences you have whether it's through extracurricular stuff or making new friends making new connections they all add to your character and they will all add to that dream in, in some respects that's what i found um in manchester and i i did um a program at uh, this uh sorry this time last year actually i was in singapore with the university so they had a, a global graduates program and that was to take um alumni so students who received the manchester bursary and they put them in destinations around the world and you meet alumni from the university so i, I applied got in and the year before that i should say i didn't get it i applied got nowhere so I applied the following year and got all the way. It's just one of those things. So I, I went to Singapore this time last year um, for a week, and I met over 20 alumni. And I, I just heard about so many stories of what they'd done since Manchester, what they'd done since they also graduated from the same platform that I'll be graduating from. And it was just fascinating to hear where they are now. Some of them have lived, uh, one of them had lived in over 60 to 100 countries in their lifetime. And that was just you know, I thought, wow, it's, 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 it's great. Um, it's what I want to, I want to get out there. I want to experience it. Um, and for me, that experience just really pushed me. And that's why I took the decision actually to graduate with a bachelor's uh, course this year, instead of staying on for the master's. because so I wanted to pursue other things. So for me, um, I would say, you know, be proactive, dream, and always, you know, have that determination and perseverance because in the end, it's you who has to work for it. Um, and there will be so many obstacles. You could fail maths like me, which is a direct obstacle to your dream. Um, but there are ways around it and there's, there's always an option and time as well. Don't think you have to you know, achieve something by the age of 22 when you graduate or you have to achieve it by 30. You can do whatever you want. Um, nobody's you know, telling you when or what you can do. So be positive um have that dream in mind and just ignore anyone who says you can't do it because you absolutely can uh, if you have the determination to do so a really really wise words and most importantly silence your own voice because sometimes the voice in your own head is stronger than any other voice out there and if you listen 
listen to that voice, then you're dead in the water. And, you know, I really like what you said about getting advice, oh, sorry, excuse me, getting experience from anywhere. You know, I remember with my uh, stepdaughters, um, one of them is like, I want to be in politics, I want to do history, and it was time for her to find a placement. And I said, well, I, I've got a placement for you if you want it with, you know, sort of kids, uh, it's CBBs. I know one of the presenters, they can get you in, get you in the gallery, all the production stuff. She's like, well, it's not anything to do with what I'm doing. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. Grab the opportunity with two hands because you will meet people along the way and people who talk to people who know people. And it's a wonderful, it's a, it's a connection. You know, it doesn't mean that you've got to be a producer in children's television. All it means is you've got an acquired another skill because you don't know where life is going to take you. you yeah. Know? And I think just to add to that, um, you know, there's, there's that, there's that, you know, old sort of convention where, you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And to an extent, you have to, you know, know something. But um, for good or for, for good or for bad, it's still true. I found in most cases, where if you know someone who works in this company, and uh, or if you have a friend, or if you meet someone, um, then those connections come in so useful. And when it came to Singapore, um, I'm, I, you know, I was talking to people who'd lived their careers sixty years. Some were in very good positions. So, so when it came to my crowdfunding, I reached out to those people. And some of them came through very generously and, and helped me out to achieve my own dream. So um, absolutely, uh, just get yourself out there because you never know what's going to come of those connections. It can only be good things most of the time. Absolutely. I say networking is king. It really is. If you struggle to talk to people that you don't know, ask questions that you know you're not sure if you're going to get an answer to practice that it's so important to be able to you know just get out there and forget about what people might think just ask questions and get to know people and just network you know i've been yeah. in all my life i love networking i love where it takes me i'll talk to people in any field any age anyone i find people fascinating but you just don't know where it's going to take you and it was kevin bacon who said he had the six degrees of separation and i always have only two <laughs> somebody, somebody. and speaking yeah, of somebody I was going to say, speaking of somebody who knows somebody, Sharon Lamb um, has um, popped in with a lovely quote that I wanted to share from Nelson Mandela. And it's so, so true. It always seems impossible until it's done. Yeah. Um, factually true, <laughs> as well as physically. Um, and I, I want to pick up something you said, actually, about ask questions, because I found throughout my education, um, in, in the UK, asking questions is something that you know people don't do, especially in the class, because they see it as something that's a, that's a weakness. And then at the end of the day, the people who ask questions get the answers, and they're the ones who go further. Uh, and I've got a very, very close friend who um, grew up in a different culture, and you know they were actively encouraged to ask questions. And you can see the difference in the class or British students and them. And they're the ones asking questions and they're the ones you know, getting the most out of it. So um, I love it when people ask me questions. Uh, even this, you know, it's just the conversation, the experience. You know, even when you're talking about things that you already know, there's always something rewarding in it. So talking to you about my experiences now, you know, is, is driving me further with what I want to do. So um, asking questions, yeah, do it. <laughs> It's so, so important. Again, when I go into schools, I'm like, please don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, sitting there hoping that somebody else is going to, you know, ask the question that you want the answer to. Can't live life like that, you know? You've got to just put yourself out there. There is no shame in not knowing, especially when you're growing up and you're young. You don't know everything. I certainly don't know everything at my age. And it's like, well, if I don't ask, how am I going to know? <laughs> exactly, yeah. I think as a, as a kid as well, you, you think even then it's not, you know, I don't want to ask a question. But, you know, when you when you get into your adulthood, you realise, you know, you, you just don't care about what a, what a kid asks as they're a child. So, um, absolutely, I think it's just about encouraging those questions and finding new ways to do it. Because if you say, anyone got any questions, there's just silence. So, yeah, yeah. new ways of asking questions. 
absolutely right and we can definitely be creative in that way so we're getting close to the end of our interview already but i want to know a couple of things before you go and um, who nominated you first of all for this award so i actually got an email um it was during term time earlier this year and the deadline i think was the end of january and I, I i read everything that comes into my inbox because you never know you know it's all about opportunities you never know what's going to come in so uh, I think it might have been at the bottom of the newsletter and I just read it and I thought, you know, equal engineers. And then I read the description, click the link and it listed this, um, you know, the description for engineering student. And I thought, oh, this is stuff I've actually done, <laughs> you know, just through Evo, just through getting out there. And so I thought, well, if I apply for this and even if I get somewhere with it, it could be in a platform I could use for Evo to boost that because the IET was a sponsor and they'd already just give me a grant for that. So I thought, you know, why not? You know, you don't know where it's going to take you. Uh, even if, you know, you don't know what you're going to get out of it, it's just worth doing it. Um, anyway, fast forward a couple of weeks and it was the end of the um, the working week on a Friday. And I had a very busy day and I was about to, you know, either go home, meet friends, can't remember. I think it was the, the night we left at you. Um, and we, uh, so I sat down and I thought, oh God, it, it's 4 it's four p.m. Wasn't there a deadline at 5 p.m. for something? So I opened a reminder, it's ETA. So I thought, okay, I'll just throw something in. Um, so I just wrote up basically just, just me, my story, what I've done today. Well, this, this conversation. Um, and, and, uh, and yeah, you know, a few weeks later, nominee. So there we go. Brilliant stuff. Isn't that great? It's just so important to... Uh, you know, one, read your emails, <laughs> and two, never be put off by a deadline, you know, just just do it anyway, make the effort, you know, and even it looks like you might not be able to achieve it the, and get there in time, just go for it anyway. So my final question has got to be, what would it mean for you to win this award? Uh, I think that the same, you know, what I was saying about when I, when I put myself in through it, it's just always about, you know, what is going to come out of it if I win it? And for me, um, it, it, it's a precedent because I don't know anyone from uh, my school, my class, my primary school who's gone into aerospace engineering. I don't know anyone who's gone into engineering, come to think of it. And so if I can do it and if I can go back with Evo or to a school presentation, I'd love to go back into my school. Um, and I was going to before times were cut short with, with Evo, but I just use, you know, look at me, I was in your position 15, 20 years ago, I don't know, and, you know, if it, if I've gone here through this this rocky road, this bumpy route, then so can you. Um, so for me, it's it's about destroying the stereotype of, of what an engineer is. Um, and it, it's just a demonstration that anyone can do it. Um, we're very lucky to live in a country that already has so much opportunity, and it's out there, and you can use it. So for me, it's about, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. And uh, I think that's what I would, I would do with the award and, and, the, and the recognition. On a personal level, you know, uh, it's great. It's great sort of recognition. And, um, it, it's, it's nice to have your work sort of recognized in that way for me. Um, but it's also, you know, my parents and just saying to them, you know, look, you know, it was worth you, you know, spending that time with me doing that homework 15 years ago that seemed pointless. It was worth it when um, you took me to see the planes at Manchester Airport. I really wanted to go and see just all those little moments that opened for me on a personal level. It's just, you know, thank you. Um, and, you know, here we are, some sort of recognition for it. It's more of a parent award, I would say, than, than a me award. <sighs> And then not forgetting your extended family, Sharon Lamb and David Lamb, who also went to University of Manchester, which he says he's very, very proud of as well. So, and the Gloria and the great aunt Gloria, having all of these wonderful people in your life. And it's just been lovely hearing about your journey and your achievements to date. And, you know, I, I just want to wish you the very best for the future. But we are all out of time. Thank you, George. Yeah, thank you. It's been really nice just reflecting on, on some experiences for me um, and also trying to get the message out there. You know, engineering is, is for everybody um, and there's nothing stopping you doing it so, so long as you tell yourself that you can do it. 
Oh, brilliant. Very, very wise words. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, as I say, talking to you. And thank you to all of you for watching. And uh, thank you to the Lamb family coming in from Australia. It's been lovely to have you in the chat as well. And um, we look forward to bringing you another webinar, webinar with uh, one of our fantastic nominees and celebrating their achievements. So for now, stay safe and take great care.